Okay, welcome back. Part two of Peace of Prepared is, our class is going to be called Peace of Preparedness. And before you ask, turn the lights out. You see up here, this was my Christmas present for my children, or from part of my children. My husband got a gun, and I got a picture. Um, so this is a little blow up of part of it, but my niece went shopping with them, and she said when they saw it, when she saw this picture, she said, and Debbie, it just reminded me of you. And um, not that I look like that, but I feel like that's kind of my job in life is to like the way to help others get their, their not my only job, but a job that I have, to help people um, get their storage together and to be prepared. So I love that, that picture. Okay, so a long, long time ago when I was about 15 or 16 and was at girls camp, um, we were camped beside a little stream. And it was a beautiful day. We hiked in, we set up our tents, you know, did our things that we did. And later that night, in the middle of the night, it started pouring, 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 pouring rain. And many of the tents actually started looking like this. Um, they were collapsing, so the ones who had collapsed tents or were leaking were moving into other tents, and we were kind of consolidating. And I was one of the youth leaders, so, you know, I got to kind of be in charge of a group of girls. And Sometime in the middle of the night, I don't know, I didn't have a watch, probably two or three in the morning, we were woken to the sound of mega, um, megaphone with, the, I don't know, the Forest Service or somebody had come in. The area that we were in was in a flash flood zone and the stream was rising and turned into torrents. And so we had to pack up and leave in the middle of the night. And so we were all roused from our beds, we had to pack everything up in the pouring rain, in the dark, and, um, and hike out. And our leaders were not very excited about it. But the leader that was from my ward, I went up to her, I, I can just remember this. I went up to her and said, isn't this just the coolest thing? And she's like, are you nuts? And, but to me, it was like exciting and because we were prepared, because we had equipment to wear, we had been hiking, we knew how to use our equipment, we'd already hiked in, so we knew where we were going, we had flashlights that worked, we had a path to follow. Um, to me it was just exciting. There was even one of the girls in my ward that had an asthma attack, we had to take her out, you know, it was exciting. And, um, and I feel like that about the last days. I mean, I think it is like way cool that we get to be here, not like this dreaded thing. So I was excited. So a lot of preparedness really has to do with your attitude. And if you're excited because you know it's like a cool thing that's happening, or if you're not excited because you're really not prepared. It's the difference between being prepared and having peace because you know what you're, what you're doing. So why should you be prepared? Oops, did I skip one? Oh, I did skip one. Oh, I skipped an important one. Okay. Zero. Okay, we're going to watch a little video for a couple minutes. I thought it was said, what I wanted to say was said. I stand really before well. the church this day and raise the warning voice. It is a prophetic voice, for I shall say only what the apostles and prophets have spoken concerning our day. It is a voice calling upon the Lord's people to prepare for the troubles and desolations which are about to be poured out upon the world without measure. The giant earthquake and the tsunami that set crashing into the coast around the Indian Ocean is just the beginning and a part of what is to come, terrible as it was. Lord has warned and forewarned us against a day of great tribulation. Too often, we pass in our comfortable complacency, rationalize that the ravages of war, economic disaster, famine, and earthquake cannot happen here. Those who believe this are either not acquainted with the revelations of the Lord, or they do not believe them. Those who smuggle these calamities will not happen. 
that they somehow will be set aside because of the righteousness of the saints are deceived and will rue the day <coughs> they harbor such a delusion. Change is also accelerating in the world around us. But much of the acceleration in the world is in troubles long prophesied for the last days. The great trials lie ahead. All of the sorrows and perils of the past are but a foretaste of what is yet to be, and we must prepare ourselves temporally and spiritually. Our spiritual preparation consists in keeping the commandments of God and taking the Holy Spirit for our guide. Now the Lord is anxious to lead us to the safety of higher ground away from the path of physical and spiritual danger. And as the world becomes darker and more dangerous, we must keep climbing. It will be our choice whether or not to move up or to stay where we are. But the Lord will invite and guide us upward by the direction of the Holy Ghost. We do not know when the calamities and troubles of the latter days will fall upon any of us as individuals, are upon bodies of the saints. He simply tells us to watch and be ready. Hope sustains us through despair. If only we could cleanse for a moment what the Lord has in store for us, not only in the next life, but in this one as well. Our hope would be unshakable and despair could never overcome us. Hope teaches that there is reason to rejoice even when all seems dark around us. I assure you that our Heavenly Father is mindful of the challenges we face in the world today. He loves each of us and will bless us as we strive to keep His commandments and seek Him through prayer. And to all who suffer, to all who feel discouraged, worried or lonely, I say with love and deep concern for you, never give in, never surrender, never allow despair to overcome your spirit. I obviously have had a lot going on in my life the last couple months. And I was feeling a little overwhelmed with trying to get two classes ready to teach tonight in a week. And I really, especially this class, I I knew that I knew that this was supposed to be the title for the class, the piece of preparedness, but I really had no clue what I was up beyond that. I had no idea what I was supposed to do tonight. And it's been through the guidance of the Holy Ghost and and the um, lessons that I've learned in the past that I was able to um, to put this together. But one of the things that I have really felt, and in fact, I just got a, um, an email this week from a man in Virginia who is um, does emergency preparedness in his state, and he asked me why I thought it was that so many people were just had their blinders on with what is going on in the world. And I, I mean, I really don't have an answer for that. I obviously, I mean, I teach this on a stake level. Usually half the people that come are from my stake and half the people are from other stakes. And, you know, for for two other stakes in this area and stakes not too far away from us, there's this is not very many people that are coming and being interested in working on their stuff. And I don't know why it is that other people aren't here. Um, but I do know that those that are listening and watching, those who are on, the, are watching what's going on, realize that things are headed in a downward spiral on many levels in this country and in the world. And we have been um, told and given some advice of how to prepare for that. So that's what tonight's class is all about. So because God does the, loves us, He gives us warnings. Um, he warned Noah before the flood came told him what to do, how to, how to build the ark, what to put on the ark. 
Um, he warned Joseph, um, well, he didn't really warn Joseph, but Joseph interpreted the dream of the seven years of feast and the seven years of famine. We also were given that morning by President Hinckley a few years back. In fact, he gave it on two different occasions. Um, Lehi's family was warned when they needed to flee because things were getting bad and what they needed to take with them. The saints um, in the early days of Na or in the days of Nabu were also warned that they needed to flee and go to what they thought was Zion, the promised land in Salt Lake. And he also warns us through other methods. We are warned through scientists who let us know where earthquake faults are and when they might be erupting and how big they might be in our area. We're warned through um, economists and people that study different, this happened to be ep economics, but who, who study and are able to share with us what they have studied. We're warned through prophets of old, um, from the Old Testament, the New Testament, from the Book of Mormon. From prophets who saw our day, who saw what was going to be happened, warned us of what was going to be happened, and actually the prophets of old didn't tell us how what we were to do about it, but latter-day prophets have given us those warnings and given us guidelines of how to prepare. And sometimes we become the ones, ones that help warn other people, our family and our friends, who maybe aren't quite really aware of what's going on in the world, um, that same guy who sent me the email said that they just had a couple that came home from the mission and um, got their, got their family, their family all together and put them all in high gear to get prepared. And so that's what their whole thing is now. And I don't know what happened on their mission, because he said they weren't doing anything before. When they came home, they were ready to move. So um, sometimes you become that, that voice to help warn your children. I think we all feel the storm clouds gathering. And we have been told, and we heard in the, that clip, that great trials have been foretold for the last days. And the, we have also been told that we are living in those days. So some of the trials were our drought, and flooding, and earthquakes, and economic disaster, and pandemics. They don't call them pandemics, but that's the, that's the, term that we use now, they call them, I can't remember what they call them, there's other terms for them, what are they? Plagues. Plagues and... Pestilence. Yes, pestilence and scourges, yes. Um, there are tornadoes and conniving men and wars that are all foretold to happen in the last days. So how do we prepare for those? Sometimes I think people feel like there's all these things that we need to prepare for and how can I possibly ever do that? But all those things are not going to happen to all of us. We just need to look at what, what could happen to us. We probably are not going to be hit by a big hurricane or a big tornado here in the Animal Valley. But earthquakes are another, you know, are another, um, another part of that that could happen and fires can happen here. So the first way we need to prepare is spiritually. And you all know how to do this. I don't need to tell you. We are told, you know, whether you're LDS or not LDS, you, you know to stay close to the Lord through prayer, through prayer and through the scriptures, to listen to the Spirit and act upon those promptings, and to remember who you are. And by that I mean that you were saved to come at this time. You knew what you were getting into before you came down here. This shouldn't be coming as a big surprise to any of you. And I tend to think that most of you are like me and reveling in the rain because we are here when things are happening and it's what we chose to do because of who we, because of who we were before we came here. So remember who you are because remembering who you are will help you stay um, on the path to accomplish the mission that you were sent here to do. Temporally is just as important as the spirit. One does not go without the other. And we have been told to organize ourselves and to prepare every needful thing. Every needful thing. That doesn't just mean food storage. And that's what the second part of this class is going to be about tonight. Um, a lot of what we're going to be learning tonight, we're just touch pretty much everything. We're just touching on it. And most of everything we'll learn tonight are things that we have whole classes on later in the year. So this is going to give you kind of a taste of what those things are. You... By preparing every needful, th oh, let's try that again. By preparing every needful thing, 
you will be in a position to be able to be a help instead of a hindrance when things happen. You can be part of the solution or you can be part of the problem. Everything works out that way. If you're prepared and you know what to be doing, then you can be helping others. If not, people are going to be helping you. You get to choose which group you want to be in. So what do you need to do to be prepared? We learned in the last class and we all know about the 90 day supply. And I think that there's a lot of reasons for the 90 day supply, part of which some people just can't get their, their, their minds grasped around the idea of a year supply, but they can handle a 90 day supply. Even though some bishops that fall in this category, they were very excited to think they didn't have to have a whole year of something, even though you're still supposed to have a year supply. So 90 day supply, if you know, the open and eat, simple, storable kinds of things. We also have longer term food supply. This is um, actually what is not a basic food supply anymore because basic is just the grains and the beans, just those two shelves or those three shelves. That's all there is to the basic. These other ones, which used to be part of the basic, the oil, the milk, the sugar, you know, your salt, um, those are all part of the basics, so you can actually make a few things from your food storage if you have that um, as part of your storage. So why store those things? Because they have a very long shelf life. They'll store 30 years if kept at a reasonable temperature. Um, they have the most nutrition for the volume. They're inexpensive. It's, it's about $400 a person for a basic year supply. Actually, just for the grains and the beans, it's even cheaper than that. Um, they provide all your vitamins except for A and C, which if you sprout, you actually will get those. And it's actually worth its weight in gold. So at some point, people will be begging you for a biscuit. They'll give you wheelbarrows of money to get a biscuit. You'll be able to trade your stuff, your old food storage for, you know, a new car if that's what you want. All right, so. I have also heard people say that they don't have enough room. These are people with 4,000 square foot houses. My house is half that size. I'm pretty sure they can find the room. Um, but there are a lot of different ways that you can store things. Um, this is, you know, a pantry. You notice, look, she just got a curtain over it. It's like an extended closet that they want to put food storage on. This has got three cases of food underneath it, just a little nightstand. This is a year supply underneath the twin size bed. This is behind their couch. They just have um, boxes of number 10 cans and then they just push it up there. You can even just put some material over the top and nobody would know the difference. I found, but I couldn't find a picture of it. There's a video of how to make a um, rotating can wrap for behind your, like using, it looks like the top of a sofa table. And underneath, it's a rotating can wrap. It's the coolest thing. And that, those instructions are on the internet. It's not hard to do. Um, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, if you want to get fancy, you can do a shelf reliance. Oops. Gosh, let's skip fast. A shelf reliance um, can wrap, which also rotates your shell or rotates your cans. Or you can convert whole rooms into fancy food storage rooms that you can do that. All right, but you can find the space. Another thing you need to think about is cooking with your food storage, and that's what lasts. Last, last hour's class was about was learning how to cook with it so that you have the other things added into your food storage to actually be able to make meals that you're going to want to eat from it. So that's another level of it. Get the food, but then learn what to do with it and store the other things you need to go with it. You also need to think about, what if I have to cook and the power's out? Do I know how to do that? Do I have supplies to do that? Do, I mean, there, this is just a... Um, quart sized can with some alcohol and toilet paper in it that can cook things. This is actually kind of how I cook the rice today, which is in one of these, an icebox cooker, a rocket stove that we're going to learn how to make, use and make later on in the year, um, an apple box oven that we're also going to learn how to use and make, solar <coughs> cooking, which we're going to make a solar cooker, not that fancy, but we're going to make one, and um, that is, what is that, a volcano okay. stove that you can cook with Dutch ovens, or you can just cook on with propane or whatever. There's a lot of varieties and way to cook. You can even just use a regular camp stove. But have some ways to cook your food, unless you're just planning on eating it, you know, cold or raw. And frankly, you know, eating cold macaroni and cheese, you know, hard that hasn't even been cooked yet, is really not all that good. 
So you might want to think about some of them. Okay. You don't want to also be like Harold. How many times did I stay at Harold? How many times? Make sure the bomb shelter's got a can opener. Ain't much good without a can opener. So make sure you've got can openers as part of your storage. If you have a lot of things that are cans or number 10 cans, they chew up can openers. You need like four of them as part of your storage. Okay? Just don't want to be like Harold. What you don't see, the rest of this cartoon had like four million bombs going off of them. Okay. All right. All right. You also want to have a financial reserve. We encourage you, wherever you may live in the world, to prepare for adversity by looking to the condition of your finances. If you have paid your debts and have a financial reserve, even though it may be small, you and your family will feel more secure and enjoy greater peace in your hearts. And this is, this is from All Safely Gathered In. There is another quote in there that it actually doesn't even tell you to pay off your debts. It just, is, it just says, get, have some money set aside. So as far as money, you can just do that one point at a time. Start saving your change, putting it in a coin jar. Oops. You know, that will quickly build up. You want to have small bills as part of your storage and something safe to put it in so fire or water doesn't, um, you know, damage it in any way. But just one point at a time. Build up that storage and build up that money. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is water. Store drinking water for circumstances in which the water supply may be polluted or disrupted. It used to be that they told us to store a tubing supply of water, which is about 14 gallons per person. That's about a gallon a day. Um, but they don't tell you a minimum anymore. And I think that that's because so many of us live in different parts of the country. We don't live in an area where there's a lot of water to be able to draw from if we can't get water out of our taps. And so in areas like ours, where not only that, but we have extreme temperatures here between the wind and the heat and the cold, um, any of those pull water out of you faster, which means you may want, even want to store a little bit more than a gallon a day. And this is just like drinking. This doesn't, and cooking doesn't really include any washing water. Um, so you can store it in any of those things. That is about um, 15 gallons or 14 gallons a person. And you can also store them in either juice bottles or soda pop bottles, but wash them and they will store safely. They just don't stack very well. You do not want to store in milk or water containers that have this kind of plastic because it disintegrates. And so that's not such a good idea because then it leaks. And believe me, I've had that happen before. Um, you can store washing water in old soap or bleach containers, but you cannot use it to drink, just wash it. And you also might want to think about getting some kind of water filter. This is one that the church sells through the distribution center. The shipping is free with them, and they're great for 72-hour kits. We'll talk more about all this stuff in the water class, but this gives you an idea of some ways of, you know, things to do for water. Um, in addition to the 14 days, because we do live in a desert, my suggestion is really if you can do three 55 gallons per person, it's really a good idea because that gives you about a three month supply of water. Um, you may not drink all that, but your neighbors may be wanting some of that at some point. So if you have 55 gallons, make sure that you've got a bun wrench, which opens and closes these little funny little things up here. They're indented, you have to have a special opener in order to seal them um, all the way. And something to, something bleach or whatever you want to use to treat your water. You also, now here we don't get this very much, but if we did get rain, sometimes we do, a way to trap the rainwater to replace your other water and a good filter. And there's even some, like I have a, up on my website, the plans to make these, you can double stack them. You can even put, see it's got a little faucet on the end, so you can just turn it on and get the water out. So there's all kinds of tricky things for water. There's another guy that I know that has a bunch of his barrels all lined up, and, and he's got a little system that goes through and circulates his water. All kinds of fancy stuff. The thing is, you need water. Oops. Okay. The next thing is clothes. Concerning clothing, we should anticipate future needs, such as extra work clothes and clothes that would supply warmth during winter months when there may be shortages or lack of heating fuel. 
I know probably most of you, like me when I first saw quotes like this, was like, well, I can always just like turn on the heater or whatever, but what if we couldn't? What if we either weren't getting into fuel because there was some kind of oil embargo, or because we just couldn't afford it because it was up to, you know, $20 a gallon and we just couldn't afford it. It was either eat or turn on our heat. That is a very real possibility. So you need to have a way, and just keeping your body warm, even if your house is not heated, you will survive and you will be fine. You just, you know, need to learn how to layer in some little tricks like that. So having extra work clothes, having clothes, especially if you've got small children, at least six months ahead of time, buying things on sale at the thrift store or whatever, so you've got clothes for them to grow into. Sweats are really good for adults and kids because they give and take with gaining and losing pounds and gaining and losing height. So they're a good thing and they're usually fairly cheap. Um, clothes to keep you warm, you know, even though here it doesn't usually get that cold, you just never know. Climate's change, things happen. Um, having some good work shoes, especially like after an earthquake, you're walking through glass and broken things with tennis shoes, they can go right through the bottom of your foot. Um, so extra clothes for people to move into uh, or grow into. Shelter and sanitation is another area we're going to be talking about and another area and being prepared in all things. Um, the first area is shelter. Your clothes is your first shelter. It's the first thing if there's an earthquake in the middle of the night, what you have on is what's keeping you safe and toasty. You want to have a good sleeping bag, something that goes to like 60 below or is rated for that, which really means you might be comfortable at, you know, freezing if you didn't have any other heat. Um, you want a good tent, something that's going to hold up to wind and rain and snow. Because as we all know, it gets windy here. The cheaper tents do not hold up to the wind. And there's nothing worse than being in a tent that's collapsing <coughs> in the middle of a rainstorm. Like the picture that we saw earlier. As far as sanitation, which is probably, I think, the easiest part of preparedness and the cheapest, you need about thinking about ways to wash your hands. Germs, like 95% of germs and illnesses are passed through hands. Um, so keeping your hands clean when things happen is important. A way to wash your clothes, a way to wash dishes, a way to wash your bodies, a way to get rid of trash, a way to, um, to deal with human waste if your plumbing is not working or for whatever reason. Um, this all, I mean, it's maybe, I don't know, not even very much money. Most of it's just gathering things together and thinking about how you want to do that. And we're going to have a class on that later on in the year. But just a little idea. I mean, thinking ahead of time, just having a bucket with a lid on it, which, you know, doesn't cost very much money. It's a whole lot better than just digging a hole in the backyard. <coughs> Lighting, heating, and fuel. And in these areas, we talk about the rule of three. Having, actually, I, the rule of three applies almost to everything in preparedness. Three different ways of cooking if there's no power. Three different ways of, you know, three different kinds of shoes. Because in the wintertime, I'm not going to want to wear, or summertime, I might, probably I'm not going to want to wear big snow boots. I'm going to want, you know, whatever. Um, so the rules of three. Wood, coal, gas, oil, kerosene, and even candles are among those items which could be reserved as fuel for warmth, cooking and light, or power. Some may be used for all of these purposes. Kerosene is one of those things that you can use for cooking, lighting, and, and heating, all of them. And kerosene stores for a very, very long time. Okay, so lighting. Make sure for all of these you've got matches, okay, if you're planning on lighting anything. You've got to store a matches. You can even store matches in number 10 cans. They'll stay for years and years that way. Um, this up here, that's a, that's a month's supply of oil for that kind of oil in it, for five hours a night. And it's about five dollars for that. So cheap. Three of those I'd have a three month supply of light at night. As far as lighting goes, you think about it, you have flashlights which are great for, you know, small areas, but if you want to sit down and eat dinner together or you know, play a game together, you need something that's going to light up part of a room. So you need different kinds of lighting. Heating, you need heating for for cooking things, you need heating maybe for keeping your house warm. A kerosene heater like this would heat up my whole house for on um, one 55-gallon of kerosene for a whole winter. So it's not that much. And they only cost, they're like $120 for this kind of. I think we got ours from Home Depot or something online. They didn't have it. Big surprise. They're not Home Depot locally. Um, okay, charcoal. Oops. 
Yeah. Charcoal can also be used for cooking, not, in, not indoors, but outdoors. And charcoal stores indefinitely as long as it's kept dry. So we'll talk about that later. And gasoline, you can only store a very small amount of gasoline here. And if you're, you are planning on storing it for any length of time, like more than a year, you need to put a stabilizer in it. And then it will store for like five years. Okay. Another part of preparedness, which you may or may not have thought of, and that is skills. By the way, most of these quotes you're seeing tonight came from a talk from Ezra Tappinson called Prepare You. I, it's up on my website. You can read it. It is the most all-inclusive talk I've ever read on preparedness. He covered every area of preparedness. People who can perform useful skills with their hands will be in increasing demand. Handymen, farmers, builders, seamstress, gardeners, and mechanics can and will prove a real blessing to their families and their fellow men. You think about what happened after or during the, um, the Great Depression. People that had skills traded them for everything. Okay? You don't have to have everything stored, or it's, you can get away with having less stored if you've got some skills. Even better, if you have your storage and you have skills. But start thinking about some of those old-fashioned kind of skills that may come in handy when things get really bad, learning how to fix things. People are no longer going out and buying new refrigerators when the refrigerator breaks. They're buying, you know, they're buying the parts and doing it themselves. And sometimes your husband may not be so handy with that. Or you may not be so handy with that. So you might want to even train for things like that. But learning skills will come in really handy. One of those skills is gardening. And there is a lot of quotes that have to do with gardening. We urge every church householder to have a year's supply of essential foodstuffs ahead. This should, as far as possible, be produced by each householder and preserved by him whether it's canning or dehydrating. But you have to learn how to do the, the gardening first and have the seeds on hand that can reproduce every year. We're gonna talk about that next month. So that if you can't buy new seeds next year, you've, got, you've been able to get the seeds from what you got the year before. So little tricks like that, but you need to learn them ahead of time. All right, surviving disasters. In our area, surviving earthquakes is a skill we need to be thinking about. As part of that, you want to do um, a preparedness plan with your family. Where's everybody going to everybody gonna meet if there's an earthquake and your neighborhood's not safe? Do you have a place that you can meet? Is there a place outside your house where you're meeting? If the house is on fire, there's an earthquake so that you know that everybody's okay. Do you have a radio that's battery or a crank or some other kind of operator that you can listen to to find out what's going on? Because not knowing what's going on is not good. It causes a lot more stress than if you know what's going on. Having some kind of 72-hour kit, and by the way, I'm not recommending this kind of 72-hour kit. I'm just letting you know, 72-hour kit. And we talk about that in the Surviving Disasters class. Um, you also might want to think about going to a CERT class, gaining some practical skills so that you'll know what to do for yourself and your family when disaster strikes. CERT, I'm telling you, is the coolest thing in the world. It's free. And they teach you great skills. It's just a great program. And you, there's a link up on my website how to find out about that and get signed up for it. And they're all over the place. Utah has huge, huge CERT programs. Um, to, to go along with that, you want to have medical supplies. It would also be well to have on hand some basic medical supplies to last for at least a year. This is from that same talk. You've probably never heard that having before, about having that in, as part of your preparedness program. If you wear glasses or contacts, you want to make sure that you've got some extra pairs. I have about 20 that are tucked all over the place because I'm always losing them and then I find them. But, um, you know, not being able to see is not a good thing. And I'm getting to the point that I can't read unless it's really big. Like, I can read this without glasses or that, but it's small. I need glasses. Um, so you want to have some glasses as part of your 72 hour kit. If you take prescription medications, especially life-threatening kind of things that if you don't get your medication, you're in big trouble, you want to make sure you have at least a month's worth, hopefully three months worth. And there are ways to do that if you think about it. I'm not going to go into that right now, but there are ways. So work on getting a three month supply. Some ba a basic first aid kit and an extended first aid kit, and then you want to learn the skills of how to use the stuff in the first aid kit. I, when I first did my, we 
have a really extensive first aid kit that we put together a few years ago. I don't know how to use most of the stuff in the first aid kit. But there are people in my ward that do know how to use that stuff. So I at least can have some of the supplies. And now I'm in the process of learning um, how to do that. You also want things for pandemics. You know, for things that you can't get to the doctor because it's too dangerous to leave your house. So things like masks and gowns and, and you know, kind of medications that you would take if you have flu-like symptoms or even um, alternative medications like essential oils, things like that you might want to learn about now and alternative ways of dealing with things if you can't get to the doctor. So medical supplies, another thing to think about. Sheltering at home, we're going to do a class on this one of these months, I can't remember which one, I think it's in March maybe. Um, we're going to talk in that class about pandemics and why we need to be paying attention to that, why that is a threat to us. Biological or chemical warfare, which also is a threat, and maybe even nuclear. So we'll touch on each of those and how those are very survivable things. You just have a few things and know what to do. So, how can you afford all this? Because I just gave you a big list of things, didn't I? See, we thought you were overloaded with food. I gave you all this other stuff. Um, there was a friend of mine who went on a mission down to South America, and they were in a very, very poor area, and she emailed this story back to me about this um, sister who there had been a big earthquake down in that area. Um, a lot of buildings were collapsed in this particular area, and the bishop was going around and checking on the people in the ward, and he got to her house, and she was sitting in a little rocking chair, or maybe it wasn't a rocking chair, but sitting in a chair in the middle of her collapsed living room that no longer had a roof, and she was sitting there eating some rice and beans, and he said, how are you doing? And she said, fine, and he said, well, how is it that you have food to eat? And do you remember the picture we had? I don't think I had a picture. I don't know. Do you remember the picture that I showed you of the, the liter bottles with the food in it? She had been, every time she made dinner, she took, if she was using a scoop of rice for dinner, she put a scoop into one of those bottles. And that was how she did her food storage, one handful at a time. And she not only had enough food for her, but she had enough food for a lot of her neighborhood to get them through until things happened. You can do things one handful at a time. The Lord will make it possible if we make a firm commitment for every family to have a year's supply of food reserves. All we have to do is, is decide, commit to do it, and then keep the commitment. Miracles will take place, the way will be opened, and we will have our storage areas filled. His talk goes on to give in pretty detail ways that you can save money to do your food storage. How to sell things that you can sell, things that you can do to be able to have money for your food storage. And he's, he actually talks in there about how don't do any of this other stuff. Don't go on vacations. Don't do anything else until you've got your food storage done. And that was in 1976. Look how much worse than that. So, now what? Okay, do you feel like this happened in class today? Sometimes I feel like this. I'm going to get in my bed and just pull the covers up and pretend none of, this, none of this was going on. However, it is going on. And even if your head is stuck in the sand, life still happens around you. And life still goes on and things still happen. So, we're going to give you some steps to success. It's like a little stairway to heaven, isn't it? A little preparedness coming. Um, so, first part. You want to improve your spiritual power. There's a lot of ways to do that. And if you're LDS and have been listening to the conferences the last three years, there's been a huge emphasis on building your relationship with the Holy Ghost and listening, learning to help, hear that still small voice, learning to follow its promptings. And I believe that the reason there has been such an emphasis on that and actually on building priesthood power for the men, um, last conference had some great talks. I just did a whole um, presentation using one of the talks from, from that. Um, is all about what's going to be happening how are you going to need to be strengthened to be able to deal emotionally with what's going to be happening as we see things unfold? So improving your spiritual power. Praying for help. If you do your part, he does his. He, however, does not do his part. You have not done your part. So you have to do your part, whatever that is. Whatever you can do, doing the best that you can do. We have been given promises that he will fill the rest after we've done everything that we can do. 
So don't feel, if you can't go out next week and buy your pillar supply, that all is lost, because it is not. If you go out and buy three cans of corn, because that's all you can get, and that's what's on sale, the Lord will know that you've done all you, have, you can do, just like the widow in the widow's money. He knows what you can do, and he will bless you. And I tend to think it will be somewhat like, I think it was, I don't remember, Isaiah. He's the one that went and visited the widow and her son, and they were eating their last meal. And he said, if you make a, if you make a cake and feed that to me, then your, your, barrel, your barrel of flour will never be not empty, and your oil won't, or whatever. You know it's so, so good, aren't they? Um, but I, I, I think that it may be like that, where if we've done after everything we can, maybe that's just going to go a little bit further than it would have normally. Um, inventory what you have. And I know you might think this is a weird thing to stick in here. But if you don't inventory what you already have, you don't know where you need to go. I've had a lot of people over the years that have told me, I have my year supply. And I say, really? That's so cool. We go over the inventory. They have like one bucket of wheat and 20 cases of milk that's 20 years old and in the garage. Right? Inventory what you have. And when you're inventorying, take into consideration how old is that food storage? Are you really going to want to eat that 20 year old milk? Because frankly, milk made 20 years old didn't taste very good and probably isn't very good to eat now. Didn't even taste good then. So take that into consideration. But inventory what you have so you know where you, where you go. Now that you have the other class about, you know, making your little master list of what you need for your meals, you have a better idea of what you need. Um, so that's for making the list of what you need and what you want comes in. And sometimes you can't, you, uh, most of us cannot get everything at one time. And really nor should we, because if you do, then you don't, can't really learn to use it and appreciate it as you go along. But the big thing is, is just doing it. One can at a time. Start with your coins in the jar. Start buying extra cans in the store. You know, pick up something that's on sale that can be part of your preparedness. Look, you know, find a bucket that you can do some laundry in and just set it aside for that. So one thing at a time. Difficult times lie ahead. We cannot get around that. None of us are going to be able to escape that. It's happening to everybody worldwide. There are natural disasters that are happening everywhere that have gotten bigger and bigger. Um, when I was getting ready for the earthquake class this year, I was looking at this chart that I have in my presentation, and it was about, or actually it's in my handout, about um, like a 5.0 to 5.9 earthquake, and it's called like a moderate earthquake, and what kind of damage it does. And I'm reading through it, and the very highest level was an 8.0. And we've had three over nines this year, okay? Earthquakes are getting bigger and stronger and coming more often. And so, not just the earthquakes, so that's something that I had never thought of, and maybe you had and I hadn't, but volcanoes. And that volcano erupted in Iceland, thank you, I see they over there, um, in Iceland. You know, you think, so a volcano, you know, erupts on the other side of the world, how is that possibly going to affect me? But look at all the airline traffic it affected, and for how long? And that wasn't even like a huge eruption. We have eruptions you know, closer to us, it can, it can cut off the sun for extended periods, which means things not grow, which means droughts and all kind of famine and all kinds of things. So there's this whole domino effect that goes on. So difficult times lie ahead. We know that. In Matthew 24, it lists all of these things are going to happen. And we see them happening. And they don't just happen once. They happen over and over. And the killer is, sometimes they happen more than one at a time. What if we had an earthquake and then a pandemic at the same time? How would you deal with those things? You can't even deal with one of them. You look at how well we dealt with Hurricane Katrina when that happened. Not so well when we knew it was coming. So, there also are things, not natural disasters, but economic crises that are happening worldwide in our state, in our country, and worldwide. That are, they're affecting all of us at this point. I was listening to the radio today and they said that there's a um, 16% unemployment, real unemployment rate going on right now. I know so many people that are either out of work or are working that are making half what they were a few years ago. Half. And you go to the grocery store, everything has gone pulling up. I mean, it is gas. You no, know, gas is a dollar a gallon more here than it is in Utah. It's huge. 25% difference. 
So prices are going up and, and people have been struggling and it's getting to the point that it's getting harder and harder for people. There are also um, all kinds of social um, things going on with, what's that called? You know, they've been protesting all over the country. Huh? Occupy. <coughs> that's just like the dumbest name ever. But occupy things that are going on. And on top of that, we have a very real thing happening with our First Amendment, with freedom of speech, and especially with freedom of religion, which I believe that is going to get worse. It may even get worse because of the coming elections. And the scriptures say that the persecution is going to get greater for Christians. And, you know, I always wondered how that was going to happen. And now I see between Proposition 8, between things that are happening with the presidential election, I see very real how that persecution could start happening. I think, why would anyone want to persecute Christian people? We're all nice, most of us anyway. And, you know, this would seem to matter. So there is a lot of difficult things that are happening on all different levels around us. And you could get very caught up in it. I have some older um, people that are my mom's age that I know that watch Fox News all the time. And they're always emailing me all this doom and gloom stuff, all the stuff that's happening, and they're all upset about, you know, whatever. And I just don't get into that. And the reason is because even though there's all this bad stuff that's happening, God always makes a balance of good. There's always balance with good. Evil never gets to win. Bad never gets to win. It never gets to be more than the good. So the good is always there if you look for it. So there's always hope. And if you have faith that God is in charge and that this is all a part of the plan, everything that's happening, then no matter what happens around us, it doesn't get me down. It doesn't make me feel like, oh no, all this stuff is happening. I'm like, I don't even care. Because no matter how it happens, we know it's going to happen. So no matter who's doing what, we know that these things are going to happen, and we know how we've been told to prepare for it. We know that miracles are going to be taking place, and I believe that's another reason why the spiritual power is so important that you build it those miracles will take place in your life, in the life of your friends and family. It will help balance you out, not only in spiritual ways, but it will give you a peace and a calmness to be able to deal with what's happening. You can do the happy dance. When all these things are happening, people will think you're weird. I have to tell you that when my dad died last a couple weeks ago, his brothers, who don't know anything about the plan of salvation or like after, neither one of them came to the funeral, they couldn't deal with it. And, you know, we just have a full perspective, and I feel that way with the whole last day thing. It is the time to celebrate. We have looked forward to this. We mean eons and eons and times of people that have been coming to this earth for thousands of years have looked forward to our day, and we get to be there for it. How cool is that? How happy dancing is that? <laughs> Okay, it's the most exciting time on earth. You know the things that are prophesied to happen, the, the city of Enoch coming down from heaven, and you know being united, the miracles are going to happen, the new Jerusalem's going to be built, the second coming of the Lord. How exciting is that? And if you stay focused on that and why we're doing all this, how can you be upset about the other stuff? You know, have some food to eat. You're good. You'll be happy. God has held you in reserve to make your appearance in the final days before the second coming of the Lord. He has saved for the final ending some of his strongest children who will help bear off his kingdom triumphantly. And that is where you come in, for you are the generation that must be prepared to meet your God. We have been told to watch and be ready. We've, told, we've been told the signs to watch for. The reason we've been told those signs is so that we know what's coming and we know when it's coming. So that when it happens, we know, oh, this is just all part of the plan. We know that this is all going to happen. We know that because this is happening, that, this is, that, that the second coming is closer. How cool is that to know that? And know that Heavenly Father loves us so much that He gave us those signs so that we wouldn't be worried. We don't have to be caught up in it. We can watch and we can be ready. And of course, the ready part has to do with your preparedness. 
It's whether you're ready spiritually and emotionally and temporally. If you are ready, then, and watching, you will not be like this poor lady here who just got tired of waiting. She didn't do very good on the enduring part of it. And she fell asleep. She didn't have enough lamp oil in her lamp. I don't want to be that way. And I don't think you want to be that way either or you wouldn't be here. We want to have light. We want to have extra oil in our lamp. And we want to be watching and be ready for the signs that are coming and be able to help ourselves and our families to be able to not only endure, but to be able to do the happy dance Why this is happening. We want to be able to feel the peace of preparedness. And I promise you that as you go home and you look at your plans and you start figuring out, well, what do I need for shelter and what do I need for food? And you start working on that and you make a plan and start working on it a little bit at a time every day that you will feel that peace. There's no other way around it. There, you just won't, you'll be able to do the happy ones. And you'll feel peace. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.